With D-Day just months away, in mid-February of 1944, warring nations were busy making preparations for the imminent invasion of Europe. Though Nazi High Command wasn't sure where the landings would take place, they were increasingly privy to supposedly top-secret Allied intelligence, and to hedge their bets, they'd spent years transforming the continent into a fortress. Built largely by slave labor, the Atlantic War consisted of approximately 3 million tons of steel and nearly 460 million cubic feet, that's 1.7 million cubic yards of concrete, and it stretched approximately 3,200 miles, that's 1,990 kilometers, along the coast between Scandinavia and Southern Europe. Studded with tank and landing craft obstacles, minefields, reinforced fortifications, bunkers, pillboxes, and armored artillery positions, it presented a formidable, and in some cases, virtually impenetrable bulwark that threatened to halt the invasion in its tracks. Meanwhile, in Nazi-occupied France, thousands of partisans, turncoats, double agents, and saboteurs worked clandestinely for their respective sides, making even the relatively sleepy town of Amiens a center of international intrigue. Moonlighting as a covert Nazi intelligence agent, a French shopkeeper named Lucien Perrieri pieced together a vast network of German sympathizers, many of whom infiltrated not only domestic resistance organizations, but a number of espionage rings set up by British and American intelligence. Now, sensitive Allied information was being delivered to the Germans at an alarming rate, and to make matters worse, Abwehr and Gestapo Brass initiated an aggressive operation to round up foreign agents and local partisans. For months, this far-reaching, counterintelligence house-cleaning initiative swept across France and the Low Countries, and as a result, prisoners began arriving by the truckload at local jails like the one in Amiens. Then, in December, nearly a dozen of the new detainees, those deemed to be the most egregious offenders, were rounded up and executed. On the cusp of the largest amphibious invasion in history, the situation was becoming increasingly bleak. That said, a new low was reached the following February, when Raymond Vivant, the highest-ranking resistance leader who hadn't yet been captured, was taken into custody. Vivant had previously established a vast network of pro-Allied informants who passed German intelligence onto Britain's MI6 and the American OSS. As the personal clearinghouse through which nearly all information passed, Vivant was not only a godsend for the Nazis, but his capture threatened to stem the flow of vital intelligence when it was needed most. If Nazi interrogators were able to coerce Vivant into revealing what he knew, the fallout could be immeasurable. In addition, his apprehension served as a huge morale crusher and brought the remaining French liberation networks to their knees. Shortly after Vivant was captured, it was discovered that American spies and British agents who just entered France were being held at Amiens as well. This seemed to indicate that either the Germans knew they were coming, or at the very least became aware of their identities and intentions shortly after their arrival. Either way, the Brits and the Yanks wanted Vivant free before he spilled the beans. And, barring that, they wanted him dead because, as they say, a dead man tells no tales. Freeing prisoners deep inside enemy territory during global wars is a bit of a tricky business. British planners knew that sending in small, well-trained special op teams with Sten guns blazing would be suicidal, and even if they did manage to get a few prisoners outside the walls, the chances of escaping would be basically nil. Hence, Operation Jericho, or Ramrod 564, was devised. The operation consisted of both ground and air operations, the former of which would involve covert local collaboration that would begin weeks before the actual attack. The latter would be carried out by more than a dozen superfast British Mosquito medium bombers that, if all went according to plan, would drop 500-pound explosives onto the prison walls, allowing those trapped inside to escape through the wreckage. The plan was brash, risky, and unconventional, but it was so crazy and would be so unexpected that if the stars aligned even just briefly, it might just work. If not, it'd be a costly and embarrassing debacle, and if dropped inaccurately, the bombs would likely kill the very prisoners that they were meant to free. And even if they hit their marks, other prisoners would almost certainly be executed in reprisal. Nonetheless, Operation Jericho was going full speed ahead, and the chips would have to fall where they may. <laughs> 
In the days leading up to the raid, dozens of undercover agents began taking up positions in streets and shops adjacent to the prison to acclimate the unwitting Germans to their presence. In addition, lookouts were stationed nearby to report changes to the prison routine, and a number of partisans who were fluent in German donned authentic SS uniforms and did their best to just blend in with the day-to-day -day bustle around Amiens. On mission day, their job would be to divert frantic soldiers and prison guards scrambling to capture escapees in the chaos. Likewise, safe houses were set up, bicycles and weapons were stockpiled, and documents were forged that might allow prisoners to slip past hastily set up checkpoints in the early hours of the search. It was rumored that even a few German prison guards were doing their bit for the operation, as was one incarcerated criminal who made a candle wax imprint of the prison's master key and had it smuggled out. The ground preparations were going well, but it was the air portion of the raid that would be the riskiest and the most dramatic. All told, more than two dozen mosquitoes and typhoons, flown by some of Britain's best pilots, would storm across the English Channel, bomb the unsuspecting prison, and liberate the Allied assets inside, after which they'd fly home and land with nary a scratch, just in time for afternoon tea. To everyone's consternation, the morning of February the 18th was exceptionally cloudy, windy, and snowy. While the pilots slumbered, Mission Commander Captain Percy Pickard, Air Vice Marshal Basil Embry, and Navigation Officer Edward Sizemore met to go over the details of Operation Jericho for one final time. Originally planned for February the 10th, the mission was supposed to be led by Embry, but since he was integral in the planning of the Normandy invasion, the duty fell to Captain Pickard. Though brave, experienced, and keen to do his duty, Picard had never attacked ground targets from low altitudes. In addition, the less than optimal weather forecast was on everyone's minds, but postponing the mission simply wasn't an option. When the air crews were up, fed, and caffeinated, they joined their superiors around a large table containing a scale model of Amiens prison and the surrounding grounds. Pointers in hand, Picard, Embry, and Sizemore reviewed vital information like where the pilots and crews would rendezvous with the escort fighters, the targets assigned to each aircraft, and the route that they'd take to get back home after they'd dropped their deadly payloads. Outside, in nearby hangars, ground crews were busy topping off the mosquitoes' fuel tanks and loading the internal bays with both high explosives and deep penetration bombs. By mid-morning, both men and machines were ready to go, and just before 1100 hours, with their Rolls-Royce Merlin engines humming away at maximum power, the pilots lined their birds up and thundered down the runway. With gobs of horsepower and light wooden frames, the 18 to Havilland mosquitoes were fast and lethal, but the weather just wouldn't cooperate. After climbing through the mire and forming up, the pilots pushed their machines to nearly 300 miles per hour, 482 kilometers an hour, and headed east. Amiens was less than 240 miles away, that's 385 kilometers, but even fully loaded and fighting a strong headwind, it would take the mosquitoes just more than an hour to cross the English Channel and arrive over the prison. As the last plane in the second wave, Picard's job included commanding the mission and assessing the damage caused by the first wave of aircraft, after which it'd call in more pinpoint strikes if necessary. There was also a dedicated camera plane to record the event. Though the intel was spotty, it was estimated that the Nazi prison camp may have held as many as 700 British and American agents, POW, and French partisans, and even more disturbingly, if the reports were true, as many as a hundred of them were slated for execution the following day. In short, Operation Jericho was their only hope of survival. Flying together through increasingly darkening clouds and driving snow, visibility quickly went to zero, and staying in formation without colliding became almost impossible. Shortly into the mission, four mosquitoes drifted into the haze and lost radio contact with the others, and another's engine caught fire, forcing it to return to base. Now, with a rapidly dwindling force, the success of the mission was even less certain. Somewhere nearby in the soupy mess, 16 Typhoon escort fighters from RAF West Hampton droned through the fog toward the predetermined rendezvous points, but suddenly to find the bombers, they had little choice but to continue on to the mainland and hope that they'd run into them somewhere west of Amiens. Then, as if by divine intervention, the sky cleared, and moments later, the two formations merged over France. Surprisingly, still on schedule, it was just a tick past noon, and below, the complacent Nazi prison guards were probably heading to lunch, perhaps their last. Storming toward the imposing prison just a few hundred yards over the treetops and church steeples, German troops immediately recognized the British planes and opened up with small arms and flak. 
The mosquitoes were so low that the crews could hear the muzzle flashes and hear the cracks. Then, circling into position, the first wave split in two and headed to the north and east walls, respectively. Fitted with delayed action fuses, the 500 pounders were designed to burrow deep into the earth before exploding, and if the pilot's aim was true, they'd reduce the masonry to rubble. Noses slightly down, the bombs detached from the mosquitoes with reassuring metallic clunks and plummeted downward. Some missed the mark, while others slammed into the walls and detonated with ear-shattering concussions. But when the smoke cleared and Picard doubled back to take a closer look, he discovered that the eastern wall was still largely intact. Then the second wave took its turn taking aim and dropped their ordnance into the inner walls, cell blocks, and guards' quarters. And in the maelstrom, soldiers, guards, and inmates were killed indiscriminately. Sensing their chance in the chaos, wary prisoners made their way through the smoke and clamor to the raised walls, but many were gunned down before gaining their freedom. Two mosquitoes had been circling overhead and were ordered to peel off and bomb the nearby railway station, which, if destroyed, would hinder German reinforcements from arriving, thereby giving the escapees more of a fighting chance to get away. Making another pass, Picard swooped down once again to get an even better view of what was going on below. Some of the prisoners had clearly made it out, but it was impossible to tell how many, and with the Nazi jailers so close at their heels, he couldn't risk strafing, so he reluctantly ordered the mosquitoes to head for home. Picard made a sweeping turn to follow them, but eight miles, 13 kilometers north of Amiens, he was set upon by a Fokker Wolf FW-190, piloted by German ace Wilhelm Meyer. Hammering the throttles, Picard hoped his plane's horsepower advantage would be enough to outpace the German fighter, but 20 millimeter cannon rounds sheared off the mosquitoes would entail. Picard lost control instantly. The plane snapped into an inverted roll, and moments later, it slammed into the ground, instantly killing both pilot and navigator bombardier J.A. Broadley. Meanwhile, on the outskirts of town, another mosquito was leading a small formation against a flag position that had just opened up on the main group. Cannons blazing, they released their bombs and permanently silenced the gun. But as they accelerated away, the lead plane took multiple rounds of an unknown origin through the cockpit. Flight Lieutenant R.W. Sampson was killed, but the wounded pilot, A.I. McRitchie, managed to make a fast belly landing in a snowy field nearby where he was promptly taken prisoner. The rest of the mosquitoes and typhoons made it home safely. All told, more than 100 prisoners died during Operation Jericho, some from bombs and others who were shot while attempting to escape. The bombing of the railway station helped, but hastily organized German search parties were able to recapture more than 170 of the 250 escapees within 48 hours. Others made it to friendly countries or rescued, while a few others were never seen again. Though successful in some respects, Operation Jericho has always been plagued by controversy and misinformation. Mission details remained classified long after the war ended, but the following nagging questions always remained. Who ordered the mission, and were there really hundreds of ultra-high-level operatives imprisoned in Amiens? Was the risk worth the reward? And then there's the other question, perhaps the most important one, and that's whatever happened to Raymond Vivant. Even now, it's alleged that though the RAF ordered the mission officially, MI6 was really calling the shots. For their part, the RAF claimed that French resistance had requested the raid. Decades after the fact, it was discovered that no mass executions were planned and that the most sensitive prisoners, for whose benefit the mission was supposedly carried out, may not have even been imprisoned in Amiens when the initial planning commenced. Whatever the case, some military historians believe the prisoners and airmen who perished may have been little more than unwitting pawns in a much larger, murkier, and more clandestine gambit, the details of which may never come to light. In the end, we'll probably never know, but Operation Jericho clearly gave the resistance a much-needed shot in the arm, and it also increased English morale in the face of the Nazi juggernaut. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe, and thank you for watching.